Hi there. This podcast was recorded in early 2023. With the acknowledgement that our world and current events shift every day, we hope you enjoy this slice of life from our community's voices. The human story is the search for belonging. From childhood to adulthood, in joy and in struggle, we all sit in questions of how to make sense of it all. What is our place? Why are we here? What is our story of searching? Join us in conversation with community members, each sharing some of their own story. I am Ben Spratt, and this is Belonging. It is an honor today to be in conversation with the Rubin family. So this is a three-generation family here at Boda Shalom, and I'm getting to sit here with Gabin, with Samantha, and with Asher. Asher, the youngest member of the family here, is a sixth grader at Rota Shalom School. And we go back through Gavin growing up here and all the way to your parents, Marsha and Chuck, true foundation stones, legends here at Rota Shalom. And to have all three of you in conversation as we get to explore your family searches for belonging. So, Gavin, I thought we could start with you. I would love to hear a bit of your journey and a bit of your own search to find your place of home and belonging. It actually began before I had a chance to even think about that question. My dad came from a Orthodox background. And when he and my mom got married, my mom came from a very uh, loosely Jewish family. They were culturally more than religiously Jewish. And there had to be a compromise and an understanding as to how they would raise a family. And they found Road of Shalom. And it checked the boxes that there was enough tradition and enough reform. And it, for me, it gave me a sense of belonging to a Jewish community. And it's been something that has been underlying in my life since I was about four years old. As a result, my parents sent me to Road of Shalom School. So I got a Jewish education as well. At the time, it was only through sixth grade. And I never thought that my own child would be able to go to Road of Shalom. And that's been a a true blessing that I was able to continue what I consider to be a Jewish community, an Upper West Side community, a faith community. The only disappointment in our life cycles is that when my now wife and I got married, uh, it was, first off, not legal in New York yet, and it was not permitted at Road of Shalom for same-sex couples to be married on the Bema. So we were not able to get married at the place that I felt I belonged, which was something that was difficult because it was a place that I was supposed to belong and I couldn't even share one of the most, one of the highlights of my life and the ability to, to get married and I couldn't do that in the place that I found belonging. And, you know, years later now, it's almost impossible for congregants to imagine that that was ever even a concern um, or a consideration. And I think it's important in some ways because it also creates this feeling of almost erasure of your own pain that you went through, um, of what it is to see a community that I think across generations has always said this is a place of belonging. And sometimes we forget just uh, how far we've come in opening wider those doors and it makes me wonder, what are the doors that are right now closed that need to be opened? And, you know, 20 years from now, who's going to be talking about the way that we've been, you know, barring and um, creating that restriction of belonging? So 
how did you come to terms with that? Um, a community that had you'd grown up in, that you had, you know, run up and down those Bema steps that had said, this is your place, you're a leader in this place. And then to feel like the door was being closed in your face, how did you handle that emotionally? It was tough because it wasn't just being a member of a congregation. My mom was very involved in the temple. She started a school store. Then she segued into working in the executive office as a director for many years until she retired. Uh, So this was a place that wasn't just a place of worship. It was a place where everyone knew me, uh, not just because I went to school, but because I worked at the shop and everyone knew my mom. So I was Marsha's daughter. My dad was Marsha's husband. And we were all members of Road of Shalom as well. You had said, you know, that it must be very painful. But in all fairness, at that point in time, that was kind of the norm. Mm. So as it, it was just reality. So even though it was disappointing, it wasn't as upsetting as it is now looking back saying, I wish that would have been part of our memory to have that. But we were very fortunate because at the time, Road of Shalom also had an out rabbi in Camille Angel. And we were very fortunate to be able to pull the Road of Community, even in a limited capacity, into our ceremony back then by having her officiate our wedding. And as a, an aside, <laughs> Rabbi Levine was the uh, rabbi at the time, and even though he couldn't participate in it, and he v- was very supportive of our bond, he was there as as moral support. Yeah, I love that. Well, and I do think that it is one of the magical elements is to see what are those rare spaces in our world where so many different stories can come together, collide, and and I will just say on the side, you know, maybe one of the things we need to think about um, in the future is like a renewal of vows ceremony or something that can, <laughs> you know, bring your love into the heartbeat of the synagogue. For number 50, we'll do that. Number 50. Okay. I'm going to hold that. I'll put that on my calendar. Okay. So, and Samantha, I would love to hear your own search. Um, some of that search has obviously led you to be a part of this Rota Shalom family, but would love to hear the broader arc of your search for belonging. My family is Jewish, much to Gavin's shock and surprise sometimes, even despite the Chin last name. Um, I did have questions of belonging early on due to not having a father present. And regardless of what happened with all that, it's part of who I am. It's definitely part of how I am. My mom met another man named Stephen Chin, who she married and he adopted us legally and he became our father. And he came from England. They were much more religious than my family, my mom, where we were raised with a Christmas tree. We, <laughs> a Christmas tree going into churches. We did go to temples some, but we were not raised to be religious in any way. And then when she married him, he said he wanted us to be bar mitzvah, and b'nai, really b'nai mitzvah, my brother and I. I had no background in Jewish day school, none of that and ended up with a private tutor for two years who was actually a a concentration camp survivor. And I think that whole experience really connected with me about connecting me to Judaism. For two years, we underwent serious tutoring and really learned not only how to read Hebrew and do our portions, but also what it meant and the connection between the Holocaust and where we were today. And because of that, I think that's part of why I chose going to Brandeis University. There was that resonance, even though there were some aspects that were quite surprising, going to a very Jewish school. I learned so much more about Judaism and our culture and our people. And when I met Gavin, we laughed because Gavin was raised to be much more religious than I was. However, I was bar mitzvah, she wasn't, and we always used to laugh about that. I could read Hebrew, she couldn't, but she has since rectified, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) With lessons through Road of Shalom, it's been really cool. Um, But once we met and she brought me to Road of, Road of became a part of my world. And it wasn't just through the relationship, it was through all the different activities, getting to know 
the rabbis, getting to know different congregants. I found some alums from rabbis who have parents in the congregation. And it was all these little connections that further cemented us. And I would say probably, Gavin, you might feel the same way. Even if it was hard not being married in Rodaf, what was amazing was actually having Asher's baby naming on the Bima with all of our families, with the with rabbis and cantors, and having such an incredible celebration that in many ways I forget about the wedding aspect and I focus mostly on the greatest joy of our lives, Asher, being born, coming into our family, and having our baby naming there and having that memory. Don't you remember that, Asher? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Be my baby. You know, Asher, you just got to hear a little bit of the search for belonging of your parents here, but I'd love to ask the question of you, and that might feel a little silly for a sixth grader, but I'm curious for you, where do you find your place of belonging, and what do you feel like you're searching for? I think I find a lot of my belonging at Road of Shalom, too. It feels a little bit special because my family has been here for so long, and now I'm here, and I'm going to be bar mitzvahed here. We're like one of the few families that have actually been here for this long, and in the lobby of the school, it shows all of the people who've graduated from Road of Shalom since whenever it started, and my mom's name is up there and it's always so cool to see it up there and know that like she was here too unfortunately it says the year that i was here too <laughs> i mean you know 2012 wasn't that long ago <laughs> Gavin, so you know. fair enough but you know also asher you went here from basically preschool yeah right? and what was in the like in that building do you remember what was in there that you would pass all the time and see your grandparents' names on it? Oh, the the fish aquarium. Yeah, the aquarium. It was donated by Mimi and Poppy. It's very cool. And I, I still remember being here when I was a little kid because sometimes we come here for basketball practices and we go into the gym. And I remember how we used to think that it was so big, but now it's just a tiny little gym. You know, and again, to go and see how these spaces have evolved and changed over time. You know, the fifth floor does not look anything like it used to. And yet we have an echo of that fish tank now at 84th Street. I think that's also one of the things that's amazing about um, having legacy buildings is we get to see that these are walls that go back generations. And yet what we do inside them is both a continuation and a constant evolution. And I feel like, Asher, you get to feel that every day. You're at Rotor Shalom School experiencing a very different school than the one, Gavin, that you experienced. And yet there's still this through line of Jewish values, this through line of learning and debate and what is to be a part of a larger community. Mm -hmm. And so, Asher, I'm curious for you, growing up here in New York City in a slightly different era than growing up in, you know, in California, for you, what does it feel like to grow up here in New York? What's your feeling about New York City? I really, it's like, it's not perfect, but I find it perfect. There are definitely things wrong with it, but to me, I just feel like I belong here, honestly. To me, when, like, it, there's just a lot of freedom here. Like, I can just walk around with my friends sometimes, and we can just, like, go out and get food. Like, some in some cities, like, people just can't do that. Like, we can actually walk places. You don't need to drive everywhere. And, and we walk pretty fast from what I hear from out-of-towners is that I was recently asked, why do New Yorkers always seem so angry? And, and I said, we're not angry. We're trying to get someplace. Yeah. <laughs> it's really funny. And do you feel that New York City is maybe even more special having had the ability to live elsewhere during COVID? Yeah, definitely. I, I miss... I, I I miss the city, but I feel like it was nice to have a little bit of a break with without like all the noise and stuff. But sometimes it was so quiet there that it would like creep me out at night. I was just like, why is it so quiet? Mm. Instead of there being like honking and sirens and everything. But I feel like it was kind of nice to have a little bit of a break from the city. 
So Asher, I'm, I'm curious because one of the things that made me fall in love with New York City is that every day I can encounter so many different layers of humanity, so many different kinds of people, so many different backgrounds and languages and smells and flavors and personality types. And some people that's really overwhelming, but for those of us who love that, there's nothing quite so dazzling. So I'm curious for you, Asher, what do you find about a city that's a mixed multitude of so many different threads and stories and backgrounds? Um, I feel like there, there's a very big homeless community here. And even just giving a dollar to someone could like make their day and really help them. And I really like that feeling of like helping someone. You know, and I think, you know, Asher, in that is, you know, you're growing up getting to experience, um, for example, people without homes and start to see that they are a part of your life in your neighborhood. And the realities of this is also means you have to keep your eyes open to see both what are the things that others lack and also what are the blessings that you have that come with responsibility. And I love this idea that you're thinking, okay, what are the ways that I would appreciate help in times of need? And therefore, when I see another person that's in need where I can do something, I'm obligated to it. It's a very different mentality than kind of the one I grew up in where we were kind of taught, you have to go and be saviors of the world. And you're actually lifting up, I think, a, a much healthier ethic, which is ultimately this is about saying we're knitted together, we're bonded together. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I'm going to ever hope that somebody will be there for me, I better start by living by being there for other people. So I'm curious how you feel that in other ways in life. How do you kind of feel that ethic of being there for other people and having other people there for you? Are there other settings where you feel that, see that? I feel like at school, like everyone's always there for each other, no matter what happens. At, at Rosh Shalom, there's very little bullying like pretty much none and people are always here for each other like if somebody falls down the stairs people will offer to take them to the nurse and help if somebody gets hurt at recess they offer for help and they help them up and I feel that that's really great so Asher you've grown up with the blessing of the most amazing parents in the world right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely absolutely 100% <laughs> and you've grown up with a clear sense of home, of belonging, of so many blessings. And I think sometimes it's easy for people to go and look at all of that blessing and assume that everything is perfect. Listen, Asher, you're a person that I see walking around the school with such confidence, such poise, a person who knows who he is and knows his place in this world. It's really remarkable. Very much the exact opposite of my experience in middle school. I was the most insecure person probably that's ever lived, okay? And I look at that, and I wonder, do you think that everyone really knows what's going on up in here and here? Because I also know that some of that poise comes also from having experienced struggle. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share a little bit of that. Like, during COVID, I really did feel, like, not included with my friends. And I feel after, like, all the online classes something that really helps me find my belonging is music like finish my homework and play video games while I listen to the music I, I I like to listen to a lot of rap and I feel like again it would just clear my mind away from thinking about how like all like I wasn't near any of my friends and they were all hanging out but I wasn't and it really helps just like clear my mind and get everything away and then I'm just like carefree as you probably know in the kind of like arc and history of hip-hop and and rap one of the things that's been interesting is this ongoing tension of to what degree is it a medium of showing strength and to what degree is a medium of actually showing real vulnerability um, and that's part of what has made it actually a form of music that has brought such connection and even community out into the world. And for you to actually be able to feel that and channel that yourself, I think is really important, Asher. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, obviously every parent has a different philosophy of how to face the struggles of the world and how to help support our kids. And I'm curious for you both, since you've walked your own journey, you both have experienced your own challenges in life, you now get to have the pleasure of watching Asher grow up in a probably even more volatile and maybe even more uncertain world. 
How do you navigate this as a family? Day by day. That's the first thing. And the sayings that you hear are very true that there is no perfect and you sort of clug along sort of like a pinball hoping to find the solution and it's hard there it's a much faster world technology wise and kids learn things in a, a much much earlier in life than than we did and it makes it very difficult as a parent because you feel like when you put out one fire another fire is right there coming up and music is something that has done that as well now he listens to a uh, different type of hip hop that while I don't personally approve of nor does Samantha we believe that it must give him something that we either aren't at that moment or can't so we are more open maybe than other parents to him listening to that type of music. So there are always going to be fires. There's changes at every stage. You think you've just gotten everything under control and something else happens, but it's the same as when we were kids. It's just different challenges. I think Gavin and I, we have a philosophy, number one, totally embedded in a loving and supporting environment. We both are people who are very close to our families. It was very important to us to maintain family from traditions. Like we have Sunday night calls every week with our family. We did through Zoom. Before that, it was in-person meals. um, Gavin's family lives across the street from us. So definitely enmeshed in each other's lives to a certain degree. So we knew family was key. I think with raising Asher, we care very much about being there no matter what the issue is. Our approach is every day is a fresh start, a new day. If yesterday wasn't so great, today's a chance for it to be better. But making sure that as Asher has issues, as we have issues, talking about it as family. Sometimes my mom will say, I don't know how you had that conversation. They were tough. About drugs, uh, breakups, problems, death relationships, friends not being there for you. We made sure to talk that through and figure out just first emotions, but then a plan. If there could be a plan or just being there to hear. And I do really want to affirm that kind of philosophy that you bring as parents because fundamentally our kids, yes, are experiencing things and having access to things at an earlier age than most of us did growing up. But even beyond that, Kids in their own ways are tapped into the very same emotions that we experience as adults. And we often don't give them credit for that. They are experiencing loss and pain. They're experiencing fear and uncertainty. And when we don't create the environment where they can feel those feelings are validated and put into a context that is relatable, uh, then we miss this opportunity for them to feel anchored, especially in the moments when they need it most. And, you know, and I think about, you know, COVID, which certainly for some came with some blessings. And I love that you as a family can both name the blessings alongside the very real challenges that it posed. You know, and and Asher, you know, watching my own kids through COVID also separated from their friends, they found their own coping mechanisms, but there was a loss that's almost immeasurable. And it's amazing to see how quickly now in a slightly different world, they kind of bounce back into friendship and relationship. But nonetheless, It means they already know the seeds of what it feels like to really be alone. What is to wonder, am I going to ever really feel that sense of belonging again? And I wonder, and I think maybe that's a little bit of what I kind of see in you, is watching the way you kind of go through school, I feel like you're attuned to this idea that there are people that might not walk in with the joy that you do. Mm -hmm. And I think about, again, in some of those advisory conversations, the way that I think you actually know what it is to bring people in, make sure that people aren't left out. And I think that's, for me, I think one of the most important ways of responding to our life story is when we've experienced pain, that that means that we want to be more attuned to the pain of others. So going back to you both for a moment as parents, what do you feel like 
has been one of the most important things that you have stumbled into learning as parents? Things that maybe you never imagined having to kind of sit in and discover. I'm curious. I wish I was more like Asher at times. There are times that I wish he was more like me. I think most <laughs> parents feel that way. What I've always noticed is since he was a little a little boy, he would go into a room as if he was already friends with the people he was interacting with. And I have always been uncomfortable first meeting people, and I would usually try to avoid those situations. Asher's always been that person that doesn't have fear like that. And I think that says a lot to why the last three years at school, they've asked Asher to be the ambassador, if you will, the welcoming committee for the new kids joining the school. I think that they tapped into something that I'm talking about is that you feel comfortable in what would normally be uncomfortable situations. I, I, by the way, I've always loved that too about him. He is, he beats, he marches to the beat of his own drummer and he's that interesting combination of confident and strong, but also kind. Like he's inclusive, brings other kids in to the point about being the ambassador, but a boy who has two moms, right? Didn't have a dad and those questions would come up from the time he was young and he handled it. They and still come up. They still come up and you've always handled it really beautifully and it's just one of those things. I think you asked about what is one of the biggest uh, things learned as a parent. I think it's realizing that our job, and it's such a strange way of thinking about it, when they're young, they are your, you are their everything and they are your everything. And your whole job is to help them grow up into these people, give them the gifts that they can about the, who they are, the confidence, the foundation for their values and their beliefs and their way of going through life. And then basically at a certain point, it's all about letting go incrementally while they find themselves. And we're, I don't want to say left behind, but to a certain extent, left to watch them and revel in them, but you are not that person in the same way. And it's such a humbling honor and experience to do that. It's, we're figuring that out. It's, it makes me a little teary, but realizing like everything is about them. And yet it's not all about them because they can't be that center because it's too much for them. Mm -hmm. They're part of the whole their whole story is ahead of them and you're now watching them and helping them lift their wings. It's kind of cool. Beautiful, Samantha. I think this is great. Okay, we had a great conversation, Asher. This is a very weird thing. Um, I'm just getting into this myself, okay? So very weird thing. But I want to offer you gratitude because it takes a lot of courage to dive into trying something new for the first time. And I really want to offer that to the two of you for whatever crazy gymnastics you did in your schedule to make this work. <laughs> and so grateful. This was just fantastic. Um, so, and thank you, Jess, for making it all possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and listening to this story of belonging. Stay connected with us on Facebook and Instagram. You can find me on Twitter at Ben H. Sprepp. For more information about CRS, visit us online at rodofshalom.org.